All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming today to our session at 9 a.m., starting our second day of the European Microfinance Week. And very happy to bring together uh, these wonderful speakers to our session. And uh, also very sorry that we couldn't manage to have also our two other speakers that are joining um, us today online. One of them, no, Dennis, because of visa issues um, that wasn't ready right after, uh, just before the conference. So here a message to the ministry or to whoever is working in foreign affairs. Uh, for us, it's very important to show the work that are doing microfinance institutions in the South and enabling them to come and present, it's imperative and we need to work on these issues. So please share the message. Um, let's get started if we have the presentation. So we are here to um, talk about how green inclusive finance fosters women's empowerment through energy access. Today we have with us Entrepreneur du Monde, Gogla, and online we have ILOFEM and ESMAP, the World Bank. I'm going to present our speakers, um, Amélie Germet, she is Head of Methodology and Social Microfinance at Entrepreneur du Monde. Rebecca Rhodes is um, Senior Project Officer at Gogla in the team of performance and investment. And we have from the World Bank, SMAP, um, Brian Bonsuk, who is in charge of the multi-tier framework um, at the SMAP team. And we have also Dennis Ndesie, um director of ILOFEM, an NGO based in Burundi. I am Natalia Real Pecarrillo, director of EDERA Sustainable Solutions and also co-head of the Green Inclusive and Climate Smart Finance Action Group of the European Microfinance Platform. How we are going to roll today our session is um, we are going to bring you a lot of inputs of our work that we have been doing um, along this year, so it will be content for you. Um, we hope that we have 10 minutes for each one, so it will be, uh, it will be intense. I hope you have had your coffee. Uh, to receive all these inputs, then um, I have some questions to our speakers to complement uh, their presentations and then open the floor to you and to our participants in the chat to have the discussion and then if time does not allow, but if then you can continue the conversation at the coffee uh, table and over the platform. All right? So let's get started with Amelie. The floor is yours. Thank you. I don't know if it's working. <laughs> I don't know if it's working. Yes. Yes. We hear I can you. Look? Okay. Yes. Good. Uh, so thank you for the introduction first. Um, so um, let's talk about EDM, Entrepreneur du Monde. So EDM is a French NGO that was created in 1998, and our Thank you. And our objective is to support highly vulnerable people to um, achieve personal empowerment. So how do we do that? We create social local organizations to help them to um, set up uh, businesses, access to energy, and more and more to adapt to climate change. And in order to do it um, over the long term, we ensure that our organizations will become operationally and financially sustainable. So now we are active in uh, 12 countries, in Haiti, West Africa, and Southeast Asia, as you can see. And um, we operate through 23 uh, organizations. So um, we have different fields of expertise, but I would like you to focus on social microfinance. You can see some key data on the screen, and um, one is very important for us. We support, um, 88% of our, the micro entrepreneurs that we support are women. So why 88%? Because as you know, 
women are overrepresented among highly vulnerable people. They don't have access to land. They don't have enough guarantee to take a loan. They are in charge of domestic tasks that prevent them to go outside the house as much as they would like. Um, and on top of that, they are also very affected by climate change, especially in rural areas where they are in charge of collecting water or wood in order to take care of their families. So for us, it's clear that climate change increased gender inequalities. But um, we don't only see women as victims of climate change, we only also perceive them as uh, part of the solution because they play this key role in uh, natural resources management. So we um, want, so for us, it's very important to develop this green inclusive finance and actually the, the survey that we conduct to identify the beneficiaries' needs uh, confirm us that access to energy is a critical matter to um, foster women empowerment. And that's something I will uh, um, develop by um, introducing to you the work that we have done with EDERA, in partnership with EDERA, mm -hmm. uh, in Senegal with Fan Soto. Um, so a few words about uh, Fan Soto. So Fan Soto is our um, institution, uh, it, uh, our microfinance institutions in Senegal. We have created it in 2016 and we operate in uh, Casamance area and uh, Matam uh, area. Uh, we support um, six, more than 16,000 beneficiaries, uh, more than 10,000 active borrowers um, with a GOP of 1.6 million euros. But the key data that I want you to remember is that we support 99% of women. Um, in 2020, we have conducted a social audit with Fansoto and we got quite a low score at the Green Index. So for us, it was a very good opportunity to conduct the Impact R study in partnership with EDERA in order to identify areas like access to energy, wash, or food security, where we could have a positive impact both for the environment and our beneficiaries. And so I will focus on the access to energy, obviously. Um, and so, so the study was very useful because it helped us to identify clearly the priority for our uh, beneficiaries. So it was not lightning, as you can read, but it was cooking. Cooking because more than 60% of our beneficiaries use three stone or traditional cook stove that generate a lot of issues for them. A lot of them reported health issues, fire incidents, minor injuries, with, and the smoke also that they will breathe, um, environment issues because um, they will have to collect the the combustibles that they will use are mostly wood or charcoal. And finally, the loss of opportunity for them because they will spend three hours, 30 minutes per day to collect, to prepare the combustible and finally to cook for their family. So it was clearly for us a call for action. So we developed, uh, so we conducted additional uh, study to specify the need to understand the offer to test the, the product, select it. So now we are, um, we are designing a loan product policy in order to ensure that the equipment that we selected will be um, accessible, financially speaking, for the women, for our beneficiaries. And we expect to distribute uh, these equipments and to disburse these loans from uh, beginning 2023. Um, so, in order to introduce uh, you again about, uh, to uh, go beyond the, uh, this client-centric approach, I will now introduce um, another, um, uh, other results related to satisfaction survey that we conducted in Cambodia for our energy access program, um, Thea Baitong. So, Again, a few words about Thea Baitong. Um, so Thea Baitong has been created in 2015. Initially, we were distributing solar lighting system, but because the Cambodian government um, 
had uh, electrification of villages uh, as a priority, we moved and we started distributing a solar motor pump system to ease uh, the irrigation for smallholders farmers. And guess what? Women are uh, a big portion uh, of these uh, smallholders farmers. So um, we have conducted this survey in order to well identify um, the profile and uh, the um, activities of our beneficiaries, but also to assess uh, the equipment that we were distributing to them. And I will just highlight a few results that can help us to see how uh, women can be empowered by that. Um, so we can see here that the main user of the so women represent 70% of the users of this motor pump. And something that is not written here is that 71% of the sales were decided of, um, by both male and female household members. Um, household members. So for us, it was a really great success because our social objective is to ensure that at least 50% of women take part of the decision or use the equipment. Mm -hmm. um, regarding the change now, so we can see on the graph the, uh, with a blue and a pink color um, that before using uh, the solar motor pump system, people were, uh, the households were spending uh, a lot of money, so 54 dollars per month, especially for gasoline, and it actually represents 15% of their monthly um, household income. We managed to decrease it, and actually some of the household, the one uh, without, uh, uh, the one without uh, pink color anymore, actually don't use anymore, uh, or don't spend any more money in gasoline. So they completely stop using the gasoline motor pump. So that's, again, a very good uh, impact in terms of environment, but also in terms of health, because they don't need to breathe all this, um, all this, all this fuel. Um, and regarding the satisfaction um, uh, results, actually, so 90% of the interviewees told us that um, the, this equipment change improved their quality of life, and something interesting when we speak about women is that many of them mentioned the fact that uh, the equipment was easy to use. Easy to use because um, we work with people who, uh, and especially women who have not been uh, to school or very, for a very short time, and uh, they don't have um, the physical capacity to move this equipment all around the field. So it was also a very good um, result for us. So just to conclude on this part, um, this tool actually was very useful for us to understand how much we can empower women because we asked these specific questions in order to know if we were doing something uh, for them. And I will conclude the, the presentation with two testimonies from our beneficiaries of the MIVO program, so our energy access program in Togo that can highlight the changes for them. So it's a video. I don't know how we can. Uh, um, yes. Maybe that. No. I don't know if this is integrated. Yes. But not sure if in this. Oh. Um, we will see if we, at the end of the session okay. we can manage with the. I think this will be a pending issue, be a pending video to share with us uh, after the session, because no um, in the PPT, it, yeah, there are some technical issues for uh, okay. playing the video. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Amelie, yes. for sharing <laughs> these experiences with the microfinance institutions, and now we will give the floor now to uh, Dennis, if we can share. Yes, yeah, um, or I can then continue. Can continue yes, and then we can <coughs> go with oh, Brian. Sorry. So, ca can you advance the slides up to? Sure. 
should I do? So in between, <laughs> um, we have, now we have the experience from Entrepreneur du Monde who is supporting directly with microfinance institutions, giving them opportunities to understand or well, like very interested in understanding what are the needs of the clients. Let's remember the case yesterday of Oiko Credit, also uh, supporting their investees to collect data from their clients and understand what is happening at, um, well, what are exactly their pains in order to better uh, shape their programs. In this case, Entrepreneur du Monde working directly with, uh, with Fansoto and implementing these tools, understand this is, these are the pains where we can work together with the women and then you know, continuing the next steps, how to develop the value chain with suppliers, developing the product, uh, testing the products, and it will be a rollout in 2023. Um, so, while Dennis gets connected, we will do a jump to then um, they work, or why are we bringing all these actors together? We have microfinance institutions, we have the ESMA, we have Gogla, and, um, and my, my message to you is the importance of from understanding what is happening with the clients. No, we are here because we are caring about the end customers, but we also have people from in the World Bank designing frameworks in order to understand at policy level where do money has to be invested, where do we, do we want our governments to put their efforts to advance in energy access. No, SDGs are not just these colors, but are exactly indicators that we want everyone to be aware in order to um, not have any more these 500 million people without electricity or the more than a billion people without um, access to clean fuels. So what we are doing um, at EDERA is providing, not bringing these frameworks that are very complex from the ESMAP, from the AMP, from FAO, and bringing them to the microfinance institutions so that they can collect the, the data by themselves. And this is possible with a digital tools, app for the data collection, giving the dashboard to the institutions so that they can see the data, with digital reports that the graphs are updated while the data is being collected. And this can be from, not this is the, mo the simplest one, the most simple one, it's um, uh, food inexperience, food insecurity experience scale from the FAO with eight questions, and the most complex one is from the MTF that we will hear later. And these questions, then you can apply them from in different countries, from Bolivia up to Philippines, and everyone could follow up what is happening, you know, what, is, what is the uh, grade of food insecurity in the specific country. So, and um, talking about these frameworks, there is especially one that it's called Women Empowerment Index in Agriculture, developed by IFPRI in a program with USAID. And we have managed to combine these frameworks for the energy access, um, have done an experience um, in Ethiopia. And this, this framework is very interesting because it, it is giving a, a methodology on how to assess women empowerment, and this is assessing what is the power within, the power to, and power with, how is the intrinsic agency of women, the instrumental agency, and collective agency, meaning um, in this project that we have um, implemented in Ethiopia with NDEV and the GA set, we have analyzed how is the production of women, how are the usage of resources, how is the income generation, do they have do they decide on the income that they are uh, having? How is the leadership? Do they, do they take part into groups? And how is the management of time that they have? And if you combine this framework with the other, with the other ones of food insecurity, energy access, water and sanitation and hygiene, you see how is um, then the, um, the effects of having, of having, for instance, clean clean technologies for cooking. So in this case, um, no, 
assessing the, um, using this index, we see that women with improved cook stoves have not, are better in terms of time management, leadership, income, resources, production, and you see this for every, um, not for every of the aspects, and then not for the ones that are very geek <laughs> with the statistics and in the value of data, it's not only that you, um, that you say, uh, I'm sure that you, I'm telling you this story, and we're sure that this testimony is, is representative for the sample that we are working, but here we're da with data and with a m structured methodology, we are sh showing you this, that these um, technologies have a value and have a potential to change livelihoods at local level. We have conducted a project that is called Impact Driven and Action Based Research and supporting different institutions. In, within these institutions were Fansoto and Palmis from Entrepreneur du Monde, giving them the tools in different countries from Haiti, Nicaragua, Senegal, Rwanda, DRC, Zambia, Colombia, uh, Uganda, and and, and now very soon in Cameroon as well, collected data for, of more than 7,000 households at client level, giving the tools to the institutions. They can decide whether they implement this with the loan officers or with external or with call centers. Um, so now institutions are free to decide the methodology, but with the message of, we, we have done a, already an effort. Uh, the initial efforts a decade ago was to understand what is the impact um, like measuring the impact with sales, with uh, loans disbursed, with outcomes. But here we want to see with granular data, already asking the households, how are you doing? Where are exactly your pains? And then having this baseline so that the institutions can then track over time what will be the effects of their programs. We have the case of Entrepreneur du Monde with different, um, no, with with a team collecting the data after these group meetings in different locations. And so, and then we can report in the same structure as the multi-tier framework that we will hear from Brian, seeing what are the aspects of electricity. Now we see that electricity was not that bad in terms of, you know, there are attributes like safety, quality, formality, it are still in tier five, but cooking being the pain. So for the World Bank, this is, these are the graphs and indicators that they want to see for Entrepreneur du Monde, Fansoto. We want to see, okay, not my, my women are suffering in terms of um, the, not the quality, the smoke that they're having, the time that they're spending collecting the fuel, um, the, the safety and the health. So these are aspects, and we are also assessing how is the health vulnerability index that we have calculated. And in this case, we have very vulnerable population where providing an ICS or providing better uh, cook stoves then will change the whole picture. Then we have also the case in Burundi, uh, where we have worked with ILOFEM, and what we, will, what we saw is not, women are the most affected collecting water um, and going, now they have to walk kilometers to go to the river. This is, this is the place where they are collecting the river. You see the quality of the water. They cannot, they don't even boil that water to drink. And you see the women and the children, and these are you not know, with the data, with the tools that they were using, having the picture, the whole assessment of what, were, what, what is happening uh, with their end customers. So by knowing this now, they can work directly with their investors and with their programs, saying this is a matter where we want to focus our, um, our efforts to change this reality. And with this message, I would like to now invite Brian, if he can join us. Yeah, great, thank you, Sam so that he tells us more about this multi-tier framework and why is it important to collect this um, more uh, range of grace on energy access. Brian, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me, right? Yes. Thank you very much I, for your 3.30 3 a.m. from yeah, Washington. Um, yeah, bravo, please. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amit. Um, 
Uh, good morning. Also here, this is morning here, uh, 3 a.m. It's a little bit earlier than you guys, but uh, yeah, still we are in the same like morning zone. I'm Brian Ku, and I'm leading the MTF multi-tier um, energy access tracking framework survey at SMAP World Bank. Um, thank you so much for having me in the conference and the opportunity to present the work that we've done. So we are seeing the energy access. Um, okay, I can. Oh, okay, first day. Okay, thank you. So. We are seeing the energy access as not as a, the end goal, but as a mean to the many ends by having access to electricity, as already a presenter and the speaker explained, they could make a lot of impact on their, their livelihood by having more time, by having a lighting, lighting source, also can saving time for the fuel collection by having a more cleaner and efficient clean, uh, clean stove. And also small and medium enterprise could improve their productivity. Uh, in case um, in, in Nepal, I interviewed the, uh, some of enterprise, enterprise um, owner, and then they, they were um, complaining about the uh, um, unplanned, uh, unplanned or the unscheduled interruption. Um, because, because of the uh, kind of uncertainty, they cannot really allocate the resource um, um, properly, and then they can affect their productivity and the profitability. Health facility can help treating more patients in a safer way. Uh, move to the next slide. I try to make the uh, presentation short. Um, so, to, so what I meant by the uh, energy access, including not only uh, access to electricity, but also modern cooking, uh, clean cooking solution. However, currently more, uh, most of the data from the National Health Service. So I'm worked, working with the uh, SDG 7 tracking report and the World Bank is the technical arm of the, um, uh, the SDG. Uh, seven um, tracking and monitoring. What we found is that most of house survey doesn't really ask a question uh, much about the uh, granularity of um, um, energy access. Um, regarding the cooking, only asking a question about the cooking field. But depending on the uh, kind of cooking solution or stove stove technology, the efficiency of a cook uh, firewood or the same same fuel source can be quite different. For the electricity. They only ask uh, many of those household surveys still asking only question about the grid connection. As you already hear from the other speaker, we are also working a lot on the off-grid solution and off-grid area, which can make a huge difference to their livelihood and their life. Sometimes it's not captured there. So um, if that's not captured by the National Statistical Office and the National Household Survey, that cannot really inform the policymaker in a timely manner. Um, so, so MTF survey, uh, we try to understand the energy access more comprehensively and try to capture the multi-dimensional nature of the energy access, as you can see in the, the, the picture in the, in the middle. Uh, so we try to understand um, the energy access from various attributes. For example, electricity, we are looking at the capacity, whether you can um, power the appliance that you want. Mm -hmm. some, of, uh, some of energy solution, you cannot power the, uh, it doesn't really provide a sufficient like, capacity to power the certain appliance. Sometimes you don't have a sufficient um, hours of electricity. You have only like a four hour or two hour, um, even though you are connected to grid. Um, and sometimes you have a lot of uh, interruption, like more than uh, three hour, four hour, sometimes 24 times you have interruption per day. That's also what we got from the data. And sometimes you have your appliance damage due to the uh, voltage fluctuation. Like you're gonna, you're gonna burn your microwave or the refrigerator or the light bulb. Um, and also cooking, not only looking into the uh, fuel, but also looking into the uh, stove design, and then we try to understand the uh, efficiency level, exposure, and also where, how many how many hours they have to spend on fuel collection or fuel like, position, and affordability also another uh, one of the uh, key dimensions that we are looking at, um, both for the electricity and cooking. So you can find more information um, from the, uh, the MTF report or the MTF uh, framework. Uh, this, I don't want to spend too much time on the explaining the methodology here. Uh, so I will also share you some more information after the presentation. Um, so MTF survey, we, we not only collect the information on the energy access, but we also try to understand how we try to collect uh, Brian, the Brian, can you? Yeah. Can you um, yeah, put your microphone closer to your mouth? Yeah, OK. Yeah, so in the MTF survey, we not only collect the uh, energy access issue, but also we collect the information on the demographic and socioeconomic status of the household, mm -hmm. uh, which enable us to do the, some more gender disaggregate analysis for the um, 
uh, in terms of the energy access status. So basically what we are doing is the, uh, we are looking at the gender of household head and then carrying out the gender disaggregate analysis um, and then try to identify the uh, gender gap in energy access and then which is gonna inform the uh, project design. So in the World Bank project, whenever they are preparing uh, either uh, development policy or the investment project, they are look, they are come up with a gender action plan. So for the energy access program and the energy access um, initiative in the country, um, our data can inform the, uh, has been inform, uh, has, has informed the project team and then task team to come up with a gender action plan, how to reduce the gender gap in energy access issue. Um, and also we are looking at the more like intra-household dynamics. So we are looking at the, uh, uh, for example, like how much time people are spending on cooking or the uh, food collection by gender of household head. And as you can imagine, uh, female household member uh, mainly responsible for the uh, cooking. So they are spending, they tend to spend more time in kitchen. So as a result, by um, improving the efficiency and then the uh, switching to the more cleaner uh, and then more efficient uh, cook stuff, they can benefit much uh, more from the uh, uh, such a technology adoption. Mm -hmm. um, and so also cooking solution, we are also working with the clean cooking project and the clean cooking team in the bank. Whenever we are working on the energy access project, nowadays we are having usually like an on-grid ex extension off-grid solution, including mini-grid and off-grid, and also clean cooking project. So clean cooking, as I mentioned, there, there's no data that they can actually use in the country. Also in Burundi, we are working with their project team. We also uh, uh, feed them with the data to understand and identify the, uh, um, the gap and then demand. And also the first step is to understand their status. So we provide such information to the team. They can come up with the uh, um, project design, incorporating the uh, data from us. So next slide. So this is the last slide. So from my understand, uh, from my experience, we mainly work with the government. So MTF has been implemented in more than 20 countries. Uh, MTF team has carried out the analysis to understand energy access status, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we can we, we provide all of this type of gender the aggregate analysis and also um, gender group analysis help the project team to understand the gender gap and then action plan um, accordingly. Particularly, we found from the data is that usually female-headed household in terms of their socioeconomic status is pretty vulnerable compared to the, their male counterpart. Um, so sometimes, I think in Ethiopia, when we work with the project team, they also identify there's such a gap. And one of the reasons why they have, a less, have, a, have less access to the electricity and energy compared to the male-headed household, they are vulnerable. Many of them are not employed. They are less educated. Um, and also uh, water. So, and on top of that, they have very uh, limited access to the uh, finance. As a result, they cannot really have a purchasing power to uh, obtain the energy solution they want. So they want to identify the uh, social group by um, gender and then also provide uh, some more like financial support and provide some program to support them, address the uh, such a gap, affordability gap. What I mean by the affordability gap, not only about the uh, um, sufficient budget that they can purchase certain energy solution upfront, but it's also more about the access to finance. So in the MTF survey, we also ask a question whether you have access to the uh, finance, informal and formal. Especially in rural area, we found that a very limited um, access to the uh, finance, which is one of the challenges that um, energy uh, practice and energy project, energy service provider are facing. So nowadays, energy service provider not only providing energy service, but also they uh, provide the uh, access to finance. But if we can identify the, some of our microfinancial micro institution in the region and in the area, then actually service provider, or we can also team up with the partner with the microfinancial institution to provide uh, such a solution to them. And another barrier that um, microfinance in the region or the, in the in the local microfinancial institution that we met, they have a very uh, almost like an absence of experience in providing a loan to the uh, energy service, uh, energy solution. So we also try to um, work with the uh, more with the microfinancial institution in the country, and we can also uh, building their capacity to understand the energy issue, so they can comfortably provide a loan to the household. And then they can ensure that, okay, the money that I borrow them will be returned. 
Yes. Um, yes. And then on top of that, what I also think is that um, sometimes like service, any service provider, they are only focusing on their technical spec. Either it's going to be 200 watt or the 10 watt peak or the 200 watt peak or the one kilowatt peak. And then they are just focusing on the uh, capacity and they provide such a solution to the end user as the first goal. But um, sometimes some of the country set the uh, kind of standard based on the tier, tier language. So you have to provide a tier one level, tier two level of uh, service. Then service provider and the microfinance institution, whoever like providing such a service, will also focusing on the uh, actual service that people can benefit, right? I mean, not only providing off grid solar product, but they're going to bundle with the, uh, some other like appliance that they can actually maximize the benefit of having electricity. So Google is also working a lot. I know that Google is working a lot on this area and that we've been also working a lot with the Google on the, not only on the MTF, but also many of the uh, uh, off-grid solar project in mm -hmm. the country. Um, so, okay, so I think yes. it's time's up. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. But you give the right floor now to uh, Rebecca so that you can continue uh, saying the, the evolution of integrating also metrics and why it's important to yep. have disaggregated data on gender for enhancing energy access. Yep, so I think um, Brian set me up quite nicely there. Um, so yeah, for those that are not um, aware, so Gogla, we're the industry association for the off-grid solar sector. Um, so what we do, we, um, we have around 200 members at the moment, consisting of off-grid solar companies, uh, from manufacturers and distributors to vertically integrated uh, companies as well that do kind of the whole value chain. Um, and we also have investors, donors, um, think tanks as well, part of, of that membership body. Um, and what we do is we aim to kind of promote the industry, create an effective enabling environment, um, and really improve the, the performance um, of the companies and the, the impact that we have on the end consumers. Um, what we look at doing um, is developing standards, tools, and guidance uh, to really kind of move that process along um, and advance the, the sector towards SDG 7. When we talk about off-grid solar products, um, we're looking at the whole um, array from a kind of entry level solar lantern through to solar home systems um, and increasingly productive use appliances as well, um, solar water pumps, fridges, um, things like that. So far, the industry has reached uh, almost half a billion people, so um, this is in around uh, 10 years, 10, 12 years. Um, with a, a, growing a, number of in, a growing amount of investment, so more than two billion um, to date. Um, and again, seeing uh, you know, lots, of, lots of good impact. So 91% of customers feel safer with off-grid solar. Um, and it's a similar, similar figure, I think, um, from the 60 de decibels energy benchmark that says um, off-grid solar consumers have an improved quality of life as well. So when we look at what we want to do for, um, to build a gender forward industry um, and really kind of integrate gender inclusion into what we do across the space, um, we actually recently worked with ESMAP to um, do a bit of a kind of temperature check on the industry. Um, we surveyed um, a kind of cross sector of the industry, had about uh, 50 respondents. Um, just to kind of really understand where we are across the three pillars of the customer base, the workforce, and leadership within the industry as well. Um, yeah, so we looked at kind of those three pillars. Um, we wanted to understand what initiatives were already happening in the industry, um, what existing networks there are, what tools, resources people know about. Because um, what, we, what we understand is that the Tools and resources exist, um, but they're kind of sporadic. Um, there's, you know, things happening, but there's no real kind of center for, for gender inclusion um, in the industry. So we, what we really want to do is kind of understand and map the space and bring all of that together. And then we can start to fill the gaps as well. Um, so what did we learn? We learned that 
Presently, only about one third of off-grid solar customers are women. Um, and this aligns with the 60 decibels energy benchmark um, as well. Um, and less than half of the companies that responded to the survey actually collected sex disaggregated data. Um, so, you know, actually we don't have a, a full picture really. Mm. Um, across the workforce, yeah, less than a third um, of uh, employees are female. So this is within the agents uh, side of things as well as the um, uh, full-time staff. And again, on the leadership side, uh, the female founders experiencing, you know, additional barriers to, to fundraising uh, than their male counterparts would as well. So across these three pillars, this is where we kind of think we need to um, really kind of increase the role of women um, in the workforce, break down the barriers uh, for investment and to increase kind of female-led companies. Um, and that by doing that, you know, we'll hopefully then reach uh, more female customers as well. Um, yeah, so I mentioned here that um, in the, the leadership, we have around two-thirds of female founders um, experience barriers. Some interesting things, so one uh, respondent mentioned that she was asked about whether or not she will have kids in the coming years, mm. whether, you know, and I, I can't imagine the same happening to, <laughs> to a, a male founder. Um, and again, like just having the kind of connections to funders and those networks uh, that, that we rely on. On the customer engagement, um, we're seeing that, yeah, like I said, less than half of, of uh, companies collecting the sex disaggregated data. Um, but even those that do, you know, we don't really understand whether that data is actually being used, whether it's being used to inform new product design, understand customer energy needs. Um, and improve basically the, the offering to, to customers. Um, so what we are doing in Goggler is um, building kind of a, a gender program around um, standards and guidelines, so helping investors um, understand how to kind of um, be sensitive to gender inclusion when they're making investment decisions. Um, and also to help companies really build, uh, build on how they incorporate gender inclusion across their, their business as well. Um, building the, the suite of kind of tools and resources for companies, um, bringing together everything that already exists. Um, ESMAP have recently done a, um, a toolkit uh, for the sector, um, which is really good. But what we want to do is understand what gaps we still have and then start to, to fill those gaps as well to help companies um, really reach, reach more people. Um, and again, yeah, build more data. So we have such a, a limited amount of, of data on gender access in the, the energy space. And I think, you know, if we, the more kind of insights that we have, the better informed we can make decisions, target support, mm -hmm. and build programs that, that can really foster kind of yeah. um, better gender inclusion. Um, and yeah, 50% of respondents said that the lack of metrics is really stopping them from understanding and designing um, gender forward uh, products and services. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also uh, are building a community around this. So we want to bring together everybody, and it's not just the, the kind of women in the industry, we want the, all of the, the companies involved, all of the stakeholders involved to come together and work on this um, as an industry, um, to share, to kind of identify best practice. Um, and yeah, so we had yeah, almost 100% of people interested in joining, uh, joining that, so that, that's our next step, really. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's me. And I will add to this, um, to the goals, that I think it's a great opportunity for Gogla and your PM microfinance platform to work together and sharing these insights, mm -hmm. now from the European microfinance platform. Uh, perhaps here we have investors that are in both networks and that can share um, insights of how are they working on the subject, women empowerment. No, we have had some mm -hmm. good experience from EMFP, um, and we can 
there could be like some transfers or opportunities to share yeah. about the work. So let's hope, uh, is it possible now to connect Dennis? Really? Oh, it, it is, yeah, uh, it is frustrating, yeah, it is. I think this is, um, I, I can tell the experience from his side. He's a wonderful person, so dedicated and so embedded into his NGO in Burundi. He has given everything for the women that he's working with, um, creating, understanding what now what are the needs that they have, bringing volunteers to support him in his work, connecting with uh, donors from New Zealand, uh, England, uh, with us. Like he's proactively always looking for opportunities to collaborate and wanted to show um, yeah, the, the work that he's doing with, uh, with the, the groups of women and how, how, <laughs> yeah, how can data um, help him or help the institution to set up priorities, especially in regions where there are so much, so much problems at so many levels that you don't know where to start because every, everywhere where you have a look at, toilet, no, impossible. You wouldn't be able to go to this toilet. So where to start to work with, uh, with the women that he's, he's working on and how to focus the programs, how to create partnerships, and this is this is one one um, yeah one way forward to, for him to to make it. I hope that we can share his experience somehow somewhere in a webinar in the future or with a video or blog. Thank you, Sam. Let's let's hope we can manage to bring his experience to you. So we can now, now, the good news is that we have more time for discussion. <laughs> it has been lots of inputs from our side. Um, now, perhaps a wrap up of what we have seen today. We have, uh, we have experiences from, no, let, let's, let's start by, by Brian. He presented in very, in very simple, um, instructive, um, yeah, like these, these pictures of the house, why, or the novelty that has brought SMAP was, if you see before, or if you see in any country the statistics about energy access, you will see only two indicators, people on grid, off grid, and how are they cooking. But if you are the ones developing programs, you want to know more. You, it's not about whether those that are on grid, do they have, can they turn on all their uh, appliances? Is it safe, that connection? Is it affordable? Is it uh, supplying the 24 hours per day, this electricity? And therefore, the, this multi-tier framework changes how stakeholders and policymakers and microfinance institutions, banks, and Investors can work on defining objectives because it's not anymore let's just connect or let's just give uh, a solar lamp, but uh, to which level do we want to, to bring, not to make our impact? Is it a tier one, just lamp and some few hours and connection to, a, um, to the mobile phone? Or do we want a full-fledged <laughs> mini-grid system where you can have already... Um, more high electricity appliances where you can earn some income, do have more uh, power intense activities, and then drive development in that region. And and the scope is not the the range of programs is very large. So we have Gogla as network, understanding what are the these companies doing in sub-Saharan Africa in South. Asia and uh, Latin America, and then seeing from their experiences how can, how can you target um, metrics so that we ensure that women are empowered and they are taken into account in all the process, from being a customer and up to who are taking decisions in the companies. And I will add also um, who are designing those programs, <laughs> who are designing the programs for uh, giving or enhancing energy access. And then we have um, Entrepreneur du Monde as investor, technical assistance, and even with the, working with microfinance institutions, 
working with them, uh, being this intermediary where information, as uh, Brian said, can give, can give guidelines. Do we want to enhance the affordability? Uh, are we going to target for accessing new technologies and how to, how to bring those programs uh, to the microfinance institutions? And from our side, just giving these IT tools. Now we are just in between providing, providing digital solutions. So with this context <laughs> uh, of panel, I would like to, no, um, I, we have some questions and then I would like to open also the floor to you for some, for some questions, but I would like to ask um, Entrepreneur Dumont, because you have different partners over the world and, and you have a team con not focusing on gender, How, what are the challenges for you uh, defining women empowerment context-based? Is it, does it change from country to country? Culture takes, you know, plays a role. How do, you, how do you address this at Entrepreneur du Monde? Okay. Um, so first, um, Entrepreneur du Monde has started working on gender really since 2019. Mm -hmm. And um, we were uh, supported by a consultant to um, improve our understanding on what was gender. Um, mm -hmm. So now everyone uh, in EDM, so in France, but also in all our uh, local social enterprises, have been trained on uh, what is gender. And it has helped us to understand that this is um, the product of social construction. And based on that, we can fight against the stereotypes or the, um, or the, the power relation rela um, coming from it. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have, as you mentioned, so two gender uh, focal points at the head office. We will train at the local level uh, gender people, who will, uh, staff, who will become uh, gender focal points. And we will give them some um, basic concept so they will be able to uh, disseminate the ideas within the staff. And then we will think with them about uh, what can be done at the local level within the organization and for our beneficiaries. And I think at the, for, even though we work with different contexts, um, that's base, well, the basic is to, we, that everyone understood is that um, we want to, um, by our gender approach, we want to give more um, visibility to these uh, stereotypes and we want to fight against them. And so everyone will be able to work on it. So we have um, a position paper. Mm -hmm. And so we have, uh, based on that, we try to um, uh, work on more um, inclusive communication to include um, um, complaint mechanism in all our uh, programs. Mm -hmm. We. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we, we manage. Yeah. Yeah. Let, it's, it's okay. Let's, okay. Uh, Dennis, can you hear us? Dennis. Yes. Oh, great. Nice. Dennis, welcome. Okay. Um, we have very little, very short time, so I will say let's go without slides. Just tell us about your organization, uh, the work that you have done, the, the challenges in women empowerment and energy, and now why to focus on energy access in Burundi. Thank you very much, Natalia, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I don't know if it's at my side to, to, to put the slides or if someone will manage. Uh, we we will go without slides. Um, let's because we have like very little time. Let's just let, uh, share with us about Ilofem, about okay. your work, about how you work with, together with the women and why to focus on energy access. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good morning again uh, to everyone. Uh, my name is Dennis Ndaize, as uh, stated. Uh, I'm the director, executive director of Ilofem Burundi, which is a local national charity that was founded in 2013 and uh, registered, officially registered in 2014. 
Our main goal is to improve the socioeconomic well-being of women, girls and children, and fight the root causes of uh, poverty. Uh, the problem that leads us to uh, creating this organization is first the limited access and control on assets and resources by women, the model of power also and, uh, and decision making in terms of accessing lands uh, and also uh, as Burundi is the patriarchal uh, society where gender norms, when we are social norms uh, promote more boys than girls. And also the third problem is the, the impact of, of climate change on women economic empowerment and the continued also gender-based violence. Uh, what are our main programs? Our main programs are three. Uh, the first program is uh, education, where we support uh, vulnerable and the rural uh, children in, in the continuing their education. Uh, we also work on the prevention of sexual and gender-based based violence. Where we work also on the promotion of women's socioeconomic empowerment. So how do we do it? Uh, we, oh, we mainly uh, focus in terms of education on school dropouts and reduction, uh, family economic empowerment, awareness, uh, promotion of youth leadership, and also sexual and reproductive health and their rights. In terms of uh, the promotion of socioeconomic empowerment, we work mainly on social leadership and participation, income generating activities, the promotion of social innovation in terms of agriculture, clean energy and nutrition, breeding of small livestock, access to credit and community savings. And uh, for the prevention of sexual and gender-based violence, we work mainly with community agents' uh, supports, listening and guiding, but also uh, lobby and advocacy. Uh, so what have we achieved uh, so far? We uh, promote the, the, the vocational and training of women in terms of tailoring, modern tailoring, and also the uh, the, the breeding or lives, the farming of chicken, where we work mainly with community cooperatives, uh, uh, composed mainly of women. And also we promote the small livelihoods like uh, basket making, uh, and this, ba this basket that are produced by women are sold both locally and internationally. We promote also pig and uh, goat farming in order to support women uh, advancement in terms of economic self-sufficiency. Because we believe that uh, livelihood activities provide means of having access of income to income, which allow families to, uh, to access education for their children, food, nutrition, uh, food, health care, and everything. We also promote the approach VSLA, which is Village Saving and Loan Association, uh, as we believe that the, in order to achieve financial inclusion, even the remote areas, the communities in the remote areas where they are not connected uh, to uh, formal bank and IMFs have also to have an opportunity to access to small credits in order to start uh, EJs. Uh, but when while working, we have also met some challenges. This is this led us to um, making a community uh, community needs assessment in order to understand more what are the needs, what are the specific needs for our community, the community we are serving. Why have we done this? Because uh, doing the needs assessment helped us to determine what needs to be accomplished to reach our mission and goals informing projects overall plan and approaches by having ad identified targeted strategies and the prioritized resources. Mm -hmm. So uh, while doing this, uh, according to data and the findings, we understood that there is a lack of electricity uh, in many, many rural village where we made this assessment and also many rural village in Burundi. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found also that more than 70% of Burundian uh, village do not access electricity. So this is a, a very big challenge to communities where there is no uh, jobs, there is no professional skills. So uh, if there is an uh, implementation of activities related to uh, access to clean energy, it may boost the economy of the rural villages and also women. 
So what do we plan as the next steps according to our findings? In terms of the first program, economic empowerment, we want to work mainly on agriculture innovation and modern techniques in order to produce manure and also uh, promote bioagriculture, uh, promote also technical and vocational training to women and the skills uh, like tailoring, as I mentioned before, basketry, carpentry, agro-food processing, and so on. But there is also a need for digital access and the training to women in, in new technology of information and communication, renewable, renewable energy also access, solar wind power, kit distribution and selection, uh, biodigester, biomass, and fishing programs, clean water access by increasing the capacity of pump, pumping and also creating new ones, uh, full range of wash programs, breeding of small livestock, and so on. In terms of education, we, we will continue also working on uh, supporting vulnerable children in rural settings and families uh, organizing sensitization campaigns uh, in order for children to continue their education and they limit also the number of school dropouts. And we continue, we will continue also working on GBP prevention or by using awareness strategies, sensitization, advocacy, and so on. So I know there is no sufficient time to uh, to present, but this is a brief about Ilofem, about the work we are doing, about the needs assessment and about the, the next steps and the areas we want to focus more on. Thank you very much for giving me, giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Yes. Thank you very much, Dennis, uh, for these insights and for sharing also with you um, about what you are doing and all the challenges and next steps ahead that you have. So, so I will, um, let's, continue also with the questions uh, because we we see here we have the um, you have first understand what is the mm. definition of women empowerment or why why to consider gender and not entrepreneur Dumont has this approach of first understanding what is it then uh, taking action and then seeing how to yeah. how to follow up this this metrics so I want to ask uh, to Rebecca um, about the metrics that Mm -hmm. Not that you are suggesting to your members to follow, also the metrics that you, as Goglas institution, if you are following within within the network itself, and if there could be, um, if and if the metrics are also aligned to the MTF. But, but let's see. Yeah. So currently, we don't actually have a standardized metrics for gender measurement in the the industry, and that's one of the areas mm -hmm. that that we want to prioritize. Is kind of what are they? How do we really understand how to measure the impact of off-grid solar on the consumers and within the industry itself as well? Um, on the investment side, um, we, there's the, the 2x challenge, and I think that's kind of the, the standard that a lot of investors and companies are starting to align with, um, which is really good just to have that kind of baseline, this is, is where we start. But when we go down um, through those pillars within the, the, the workforce and to the consumers, I think that's where we have um, more of a challenge and we really need to kind of think about how do we really understand, okay, so when you have a SHS, a, a solar home system that, that's been sold, pr normally that, you know, 70% of those customers at the moment are male. That does not mean that within the household, the main user might be the woman, but we don't understand that at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's really tricky to, to try and measure at a company and con consumer level, is how the products are actually impacting uh, women in the households as well. So we can understand who the customer is, but not necessarily who the user is, and is it meeting the user's needs? So that's a gap, and I'm, I'm going to be honest that, and say that's that something perhaps that... perhaps MTF survey mm -hmm. through the companies yep. or th through the microfinance exactly. institutions could support, right? Yes, yeah. So it's, yeah, how do we, like, dig a little bit deeper? So I think 60 decibels, they're also doing mm -hmm. um, a lot of work on this and how to kind of um, get to that kind of lower level understanding of, of really how do we measure and what metrics do we need to follow on this. Mm -hmm. And at... Um, Curious to know if Gogla at your institution, do you have 
some metrics uh, for gender women empowerment? We internally, I mean, we're a small organization. We, we measure, yeah, we track. Um, within our members, we don't yet. So that's one of yeah. our priorities, yeah, for, for okay. next year, actually, within the, the gender program is to um, understand those and then kind of um, recommend them for the, the companies that we work with as well, yeah. all of our members. So, so let's hear uh, Brian, um, not, not talking about like from the policy maker and uh, as you see here with the microfinance stakeholders, they, they could play a role in collecting the, that data, but also how could they inform policy makers or what do you think it's necessary in order to um, um, to take value of of the role of data from microfinance institutions to policy makers to you in further developing this this framework okay so mtf uh, can you hear me right yes so mtf is the uh, one-time survey so we don't really do the uh, like a follow-up survey on the ground quite closely but I think the strength of the microfinance institution, they have a local presence and they can keep tracking of the, all this the difference that um, energy solution is making and then their, their product and their service is making. So if you can, uh, if the, uh, the data, kind of time series data to measure the uh, impact, um, I think they're gonna be very, very powerful story to the also policymaker as well as the project uh, practitioner who are working on the, uh, this component. In the World Bank, in the project, we have a matrix, a gender matrix, and we have a gender specialist working on the, uh, such indicator, um, the beneficiary number of the project. And then we also identified the gender gap. So they, we have a specific like a gender indicator for the, uh, the beneficiary. And also working with the uh, company uh, or utility, we also provided some gender metrics for the certain like position or the uh, trainee number based on the agenda. So we have uh, some uh, metrics there. But if we have uh, more data from the uh, uh, on the ground, closer monitoring as time goes by and the, uh, measuring the impact, I think they're going to be a pretty powerful tool to pitch to the uh, uh, policymaker as 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 well as the uh, the uh, practitioner and investor. Over. Yeah, especially also to the practitioners. I think, um, um, Dennis, if now you mention a list of 10 next steps that you have from all the priorities and from the data that you have gathered, what will you think this, uh, what action will be the most impactful for the women that you are working with? If you could select the top three, and share with the audience where would you uh, like to collaborate and have support the three most impactful? Just earlier, sorry. We lost him. <laughs> but we have, okay, we have five minutes. I, uh, if you can tell us, no, which, what do you think will be the most impactful activity or um, project that could have that could have Dennis or Burundi in Ilofem um, for supporting the women that they are working with. What will you say? Energy access, WASH program, raise his hand. Any, any other, yeah, do you have any question? Is there any question also on the chat, Dania? Also in, yes. Yeah. Um, so it's very interesting. Uh, I loved all the surveys and data. Um, and I think one of my questions was uh, the 30%, I think I got that, how women uh, who did have uh, take up um, renewable energy or solar uh, or cooking uh, that was clean energy. So what were the enablers, do you know, that were enabling these 30% to, to access? And I think that was Entrepreneur du Monde that was... Uh, can you, can what you what were the enablers? Yeah. What were the enablers um, for the thirty percent of women mm -hmm. that um, that you showed at the beginning that uh, were enablers for energy access? It was in the energy access program. Or just program? in general? I mean, what would you say as experts are the enabling factors 
that would enable more gender access to uh, the products and services that you're uh, supporting. More gender access to? Sorry. To all the products and services that you're promoting for gender. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, actually, um, the, um, the vision of uh, Entrepreneur Demands is that we cannot um, support, um, that we cannot tackle gender uh, inequalities if we only consider uh, financial services alone. And so we, have, we need to have this holistic uh, approach. And actually, so when, so I'll just uh, catch up with your question for Denis. I think it's very tricky to, to, to know what could be the, the priority because um, um, if I give an example, so in, uh, in Togo, we have, uh, we have been working mm. with um, a social microfinance called Asila Sime. Again, with uh, more than 90% of our beneficiaries are women. Then we have included this energy program, MIVO, mm -hmm. working in the same uh, area, so we have connection. And now we are working more and more in rural areas, so we need also to train people about some uh, techniques on agroforestry, so we are mm -hmm. working on it. And uh, we, will, uh, we have added a recycling project because we know that the, the, the communities where we are working, there are a lot of things to do regarding waste management that can be also a value for this woman. And we will start um, uh, next year a work regarding uh, um, menstrual precarity. So we will uh, distribute uh, affordable, environmental friendly, um, and uh, um, protect hygiene protection for women uh, in order to, um, because we have, again, thanks to uh, some uh, data, we have seen that uh, women will, uh, the girls will miss school, women will stop uh, working in their uh, IGA, uh, income generating activities because of their <coughs> periods. So it's something that we want to tackle, but that's true that the, the, the scope is broad. I, I will like, in, in, in summarize, I will say that green inclusive finance or not only providing the financial services alone, mm. but expanding and having a look at the potential, okay. like having already the infrastructure from the microfinance institutions, this close relationship, understanding what are the needs and providing non-financial services exactly for those specific topics where you see there is um, a need, a, a need mm. for tackling, providing assistance, more capacity building, um, access to suppliers, to technologies, and expanding, yeah. going beyond the financial services have been those enablers. I think it's um, kind of why we add to that as well, yes. actually. So on the, the pay-as-you-go um, sector, I think one of the big enablers is more female agents as mm -hmm. well, because they um, are more equipped and have the knowledge and skills to actually reach female mm -hmm. consumers. Um, and that's, that's a challenge in itself because the agents have, female agents have barriers and challenges that, that the male, their male counterparts don't. So if we can actually overcome those barriers, so security issues, um, childcare issues, um, and just kind of movement, um, then we can, you know, then the, the knock-on effect of that is we, we won't reach more female end users and female customers as well. So I think it needs to be looked at holistically. So it starts from kind of the leadership and the workforce and that kind of goes all the way to the consumers as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, uh, do we have, Sam, can we have a, one more question from the audience? Yeah. Any other comment, remark? Do you want to share as well your experience? Ready for a coffee now <laughs> to digest all these inputs? Now, if we're done for today, because we are already 10, 20, and now going for the coffee break, I thank you very much, our um, speakers, Brian, Good morning to you, starting your day. <laughs> uh, to, to Dennis, if you can still hear Good us. <laughs> and thank you very much, you, Amelie Rebecca. and Rebecca. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.